Good evening all, and welcome. Tonight, we are going to listen to some stories about some people who I'm sure you would rather not meet. So get ready, because it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. About a year ago when I was 20, I got a new job. I didn't have a car, so I had to take the bus. I had to catch two buses to get to my job. My second stop was a layover, so I typically had about 30 minutes before that bus left. One day, I had gone into the Walmart by the bus stop to pick up some lunch for work. The bus stop was right behind a plaza that had various stores and restaurants. A heavier set man with curly hair, probably in his mid thirties, walked out behind me. He said, Hey, has anyone ever told you that you look like Zoe Kravitz? I have a weird thing about being rude to people who are hitting on me because I'm terrified they'll hurt me if I'm mean to them. It does happen to women quite often. I just said, uh, thanks, and kept walking to my bus stop. He saw me walking to my bus and called after me. Hey, Zoe, do you need a ride? I was very irritated that he had called me Zoe. So I just said no and ran onto my bus. About a week after that, I ran into him again at the same Walmart, and I heard, Hey Zoe, and he ran up to me. I saw him closing the door of a burgundy van. It was one of those stereotypical creeper vans that only had the front windows. This made me super uneasy, and I turned around and kept walking. Oh Zoe, I heard him sing from behind me. I replied with, my name isn't Zoe. He asked me what my name was. One of the Walmart employees saw me looking uncomfortable and ran up to me and said, Oh, hey, Melissa. It's good to see you. I'm about to go on lunch if you want to come with me. I'll go clock out real quick. At first, I was confused because Melissa is also not my name. Then I realized what was going on. So I just said, oh yeah, of course. Once we were out of earshot, she told me that they'd been having a lot of problems with that guy doing similar things to women around the plaza. He was known for harassing women, specifically tall, skinny, light-skinned women like myself. She told me her manager was trying to get him banned from the Walmart, but had been unsuccessful. We waited for about 15 minutes then she walked out with me with a male co-worker, and they snuck me out the back and walked me to the bus. I didn't see him for a while. And then one day, when I went to go catch my second bus, I saw his van waiting in the parking lot near the bus stop. I thought maybe this isn't him, and I'm just paranoid. I walked past the van, and it started moving slowly towards me. Hey Zoe! We didn't get to talk last time. You never told me your name. I ignored him and started sprinting. He floored it and stopped his van in front of me and got out. I screamed as loud as I could to attract attention because it was broad daylight. And once I screamed, people started to look and one person came to me and asked if I was okay. He had sped off once I screamed. I went to Walmart and called my co-worker to pick me up. They took me to work for the next couple of days. Then came their off day. I got the bus and thought, well, if I go to Tim Hortons instead of Walmart, I'll be fine, right? I was ordering at the counter and I didn't realize he had seen me and gone up through the drive through The way this Tim Hortons was set out you could see right to the counter from the drive through window, and vice versa. I heard it. Zoe! And my heart sank. I ran to the bathroom 
and hid for a few minutes and walked out. The employees told me that he seemed really pissed off when I didn't respond. I told them that I'd been having issues with him for weeks. This time, I was again escorted to the bus stop by an employee. I looked around for his van and didn't see it. So I felt safe and sat down on a bench. I didn't want to get on a bus yet because it was a nice day and I wanted to enjoy it. Then I heard screeching and a door slam. He got out of his van screaming. You gonna stop ignoring me, Zoe? I scrambled to get on the bus and he followed me on the bus screaming at me. I started crying and saying, I don't know you. Stop following me. At this point, the other passengers began standing up for me and threatening the man. He eventually got off the bus. After this, I changed my work schedule so I could ride with a co-worker every day. And I haven't seen him since. For the last year, I've been having to go to the laundromat at least once a week due to not being able to afford a new washer and dryer up front. It's never been an issue until a few weeks ago. I went one night and there was an older gentleman sitting there. I've never seen him before, but there aren't really the same people when I go. At one point, I heard him mumbling to himself, but there were plenty of people, so I wasn't worried. I walked out the door to my car and he was sitting at a table with his head down. When I got around to the driver's side of my door, I looked up at him, standing at the laundromat door, staring straight at me. I froze. I was so scared. I sent my husband a text with a full description of him just in case. Last week I was there with my oldest son and the same man was just sitting there wearing the same outfit. So I started to wonder. We were the only three there and my laundry was the only laundry being done. It clicked that maybe he's homeless and he comes at night to stay warm. I left a couple of dollars by the vending machine when I was leaving as I heard him get change and get a snack. A couple of nights later, I had to go again to wash blankets and he was there once more. These two occasions, I never got any weird vibes like the first night, and I wrote him off as harmless. Tonight, I had to go there with my three kids while my husband was helping a friend at his house. When we got there, there was no one but us, and we were sitting at the front of the place. My laundry was in washers at the back, so when I went back to check the washers, I saw it was almost done. I continued around the corner to grab a basket and the homeless man was standing there. I jumped because I didn't hear anyone come in and he definitely was not there when we walked in. I continued past him and walked up to the other side where my children were sitting. At this point I hear him talking to himself. She saw me and got scared and ran off. You're stupid and I heard the bathroom door slam shut. Alarm bells are going off, and I'm quietly hurrying my kids to get their stuff gathered. I considered slipping out of the front door that we were sitting by, and walking down the alley and around to my car. It was dark, and my kids were already getting scared, so I decided not to. We all held hands and walked straight to the back. I thought he was still in the bathroom because I didn't hear him come out. When we passed the sitting area in the back, he was standing there combing his hair. We continued out the door like we weren't peeing our pants scared. I got them in the car and went around to get in. And he was there again standing at the back door, staring at us. I quickly got in, locked the doors and left, and called my husband so I could pick him up. We all came back to switch the clothes and wait for them to dry. The man was still there. The man walked out staring at me the entire time. He did two circles around the place still staring. 
My husband went back in once the clothes were dry and said the man wasn't there. I'm officially creeped out by this. I plan on going during the day from now on, and I don't plan on staying if I'm the only person there. Hopefully, by the beginning of the year, I can stop going. Am I being crazy? Or is this a real creep? Alas, I'm stuck on a bus again with 40 minutes of time to kill, and no music in my new phone. This happened to me in June. Our school exams start around June 20th every year, and well, I choose to not do math the entire year and study hardcore the last month. Our school is a private school, and I can't afford without a scholarship, so I have to get good results on those exams. So I got a tutor, who's also my best friend's mum. I spend almost every day at their place, which is on the other side of our small city. I live in Armenia for context, and we're a poor second world country, so our public transport kinda sucks. A taxi is expensive, Minimum from our place to theirs is about a thousand dram, which is like two dollars, but is more like fifteen for us. So I have a crappy minibus for forty minutes every time I go and come back. Now until then, my experience with public transports were pretty mild. I'm a girl, which, if you're not an ogre, results in at least a small amount of unnecessary attention. But you get used to it after a while. Nothing too worrying. I got hit on once or twice, and stared at a lot, but it never really bothered me. I get away with it most of the time because of my chronic angry face. I look like the most unapproachable person in the world, let alone the bus or the station. So when this happened, I was beyond shocked. That particular day, I had to stay longer than usual. It was four days before the exam, and I was extra panicky. Also should note that I looked like absolute crap. My hair was in a greasy bun, and I was wearing a huge hoodie and sweatpants. Not saying that's a horrible look for everyone, but me in particular. I looked like a potato sack with a head and an onion on her head. So, I got out at around 8.30pm and it was getting dark. When I got the bus, it was full dark, and the bus was completely empty. Now to explain this properly, you need to imagine the bus I was in, and how the seats are positioned. I'm sitting on the first seat next to the window, the left one. I was the first passenger here, so two stops later, three men get on the bus. This dude, who had the full ability to sit anywhere he wanted to on the bus, elected to sit next to me. I didn't really give it much thought, cause, eh, it's the first row. Maybe he just sat where he could. The two other dudes sat in the front next to the driver's seat. We drive for another two stops, and a girl gets on. He gets up and moves to the seat behind his, and the girl sits next to me. He started talking to her, and she seemed quite uncomfortable, although giggled along. On the next stop, he moved to the singular seat next to the window. Now, this is where the first red flag comes in. He turns to our full side body and continues talking to her like, Pretty girl, where are you getting off? Maybe with me? And she says no, and continues giggling uncomfortably. At this point, the driver himself is side-eyeing this dude. A stop later, she gets up to pay, and he touches her thigh. She turns around and yells at him to stop. The driver turns around in anger, and tells him to sit down, and not move until he gets off the bus. Kudos to the driver's honesty. Stuff like this is common bus culture, and it happened a couple of times to me, and nobody ever said anything. Regardless, she practically jumped off the bus and speed walks away. My heart is racing at this point. I know it would have been noble of me to protect her, 
but I honestly couldn't. I was scared of the dude, and I wouldn't have stopped him. It was 9.45 by now, and the streets are emptying. I had my headphones in, but I turned the music off, because I'm scared of this dude, and I'm alone with him, and no one but an old man, the driver, and one of the dudes from earlier who's fast asleep, are on the bus. That's when he turns to me. How old even are you? I didn't answer, and pretended not to hear him. He didn't ask again. I was facing away from him, and looking out of the window. Instead, I felt the flash of his camera. I turned around, and he was holding his phone at me. He was grinning, and looked at me, as if I were his friend who he just pranked or something. I didn't say anything, and continued to look out the window. At this point I was full on panicking. I opened my bag as casually as I could, and mentally screamed at myself. I'd left my pocket knife at my friend's house earlier that week, and kept forgetting to take it back. So I took a pencil out, one of the mechanical ones with a metal nib, and quickly put it in my pocket. Then another flash came. This time it was with the camera too. I literally dialed 911 and sat there. I didn't call it, I just put the number in just in case and texted my friend. Then, he was typing something. When I got to my stop, I didn't ask for the bus to stop until we were right at it. The second I was about to pass my stop, I basically screamed for the driver to stop. He quickly stopped, and I got off really quick. He didn't have enough time to get off as well, as the driver soon drove off and left, probably because he realised what was happening and didn't want him to follow me. I still don't understand why anyone would need a picture of me. I don't even want to, especially not then, like that. A couple of days later, when I was at that bus stop, now heading from my place to my friend's place, I saw the guy again. He tried to talk to me, and asked me again how old I was. I promptly told him it was none of his business and walked away. He tried to follow me, but I went into the local pet shop, and I know the owner after six years of being there regular, and she told him, more strongly, to leave. I never saw him again, nor do I ever want to. This happened a couple of weeks ago. I live in a major city. My street is a narrow one way. Cars can parallel park on one side of the street, and it fits 30 cars. I'm outside my door, which is at the end of the street, smoking a cigarette before bed. I'm looking across the street, and to my right I see something out of the corner of my eye behind one of the parked cars way down. It was just a movement. I didn't really get a good look at it, so I kept smoking, and a couple of seconds later I saw it again. This time it looked like someone had ducked behind the cars. This street is well lit, but it was hard to see because there were maybe 25 or so cars, and it was fast. It was about three seconds, and I saw a head pop up from the car in front of the last one I saw. It was clearly a head. Then it dug down again, and before I knew it, it had happened again, and popped up in front of that car, and was still now. Whoever it was knew I saw him. He ducked again, and in a flash was popping his head up from the next car, getting closer to me. He definitely knew that I saw him. He moved really fast, but not supernaturally fast, just very quick. Up until this point, I was curious, but now feeling really uneasy. I'm 5 foot 11 and 185 pounds, and work out, but I can't remember the last fight I had. It was so creepy. He's now about six cards lengths away, and I can see him clearly. He's looking directly at me. He looks pretty normal, bigger than me and has glasses on. Then he ducks again. I almost pissed myself and ran into my house, and closed the door and looked through the peephole. I could only see one car, 
and half of another one, and could imagine the guy ducking down and scurrying to the next car and popping up again. I was just about to stop looking as he popped up right in the back of the car and parked in front of my house. He definitely could not see me. I had no lights on in the hallway outside and inside, but he just stood there looking at me. He looked like he was mad about something. He took his glasses off and wiped them and stuck them in his pocket. I couldn't see his lower half, but it looked like he was wearing a long coat. He was looking directly at me. For a minute, it looked like he was going to walk, and I was hoping he was not going to come around the car and get up to my door. Then he ducked down and out of sight. I was getting freaked out at this point. I stood at the door until 3.25 a.m., listening. Then I went to bed and was awake listening for a while. I worked at a local coffee shop as a barista for a few months. I was 17 at the time, and I'm currently 20. My co-workers knew about Gregory, but never paid him much mind. He had a big scar, or birthmark, on the entire left half of his face. Sometimes he carried around a radio that only played static, and he would intently listen to it. He was known to hold up those crazy, the world is ending and you're going to hell, signs. He was homeless. He would buy espresso shots with so much honey and lick the honey out the cup, which was always gross and unsightly. But he was never mean or too creepy and didn't bother anyone. He just came off as weird with how he spoke and what he said. It was all over the place. He would jump from one sentence to the next, but it was still tangible. Anyway, one night I was working alone and later closing with my co-worker, who was a very small petite girl. Always smiling, not intimidating. It was probably 7pm. She came in at 8 or 8.30. Note, I am a trans guy, have short hair and all, but I'm not on hormones, so I still look kind of feminine. I had two regulars that sat at the bar with me, and it was not very full in the lobby, and in comes Gregory. But this time he seems a bit off, more so than usual. He comes up to the register and immediately said something like, Hey, how you doing? I'm here to buy some coffee if I can, if the Lord will let me have one tonight. Cause my card may be empty, but if he says so. And I'm immediately like, okay. And ask him if he wants the same thing as usual. He repeats almost the exact same sentence, adding, if the Lord will let me tonight, I'll have one. I don't got much. Maybe he wants me to go sleep instead of have a drink, but I'll see if not, then I'll go to sleep. Like his sentences were very quick and erratic, hence the poor grammar. So I run his card and it's empty. Gregory goes, ah oh well, looks like the Lord wants me to go to bed and not have a drink tonight. You know, if the Lord says it, it's the truth, right? Which is assuming I'm religious in the first place. I live in Arkansas, and I just go, ah, yeah, sorry, Gregory. By the way, you left your hat in here last time. If it was still in here, I'd give it to you. He cuts me off a bit aggressively. Oh, I don't need possessions. They don't mean a thing compared to the Lord's love, you know. As long as I got my heart and soul, and as long as you got God and believe in him, he'll do great things for you, you know. Say... What's your name again? Finn. How old are you? You seem young. I said 19. At this point, when he asked my age, I was weirded out a bit more. But here's where it gets uncomfortable. 
He asks if I'm married. I didn't intentionally understand him, so I asked him again, and he goes, Are you married? I say, Uh, I'm not. As soon as I say no, he cuts me off and starts talking even more erratically and quickly, and almost stuttering over himself, where I have to try and focus to even listen. He told me his full name, his age, he was in his mid-fifties, and when and where he was born. Then he goes on to say that he has no money, but to go to the Outback Steakhouse, find this person, give me their full name, and says he doesn't have any money right now, because he gets his checks at the end of the month, but that won't be a problem for us. Obviously, I'm super creeped out. And reminder, the two regular guys at the bar are having to watch and hear this whole interaction go down. I finally decided I needed to ask him to leave and say, Gregory, stop. I'm not married, but I have a boyfriend. Which is true. And I'm gonna have... I couldn't even finish my sentence. And he interrupts me again, raising his voice, saying, Is he gonna commit to you? Is he? If not, you let me know and I'll take good care of you. Nam rattles on about how he can never find a woman to be with, also assuming I was a woman. I attempt to tell him he needs to leave and firmly says no, and he gets physically angry. His facial expressions snapped from upset and confused to pissed. He doesn't say a word, but instead, in the middle of me saying no, whips around and walks out the door, slamming it super hard against the glass and walking down the sidewalk to leave. Luckily, no one in the lobby really heard much but the guys at the counter, and they were just as shocked as me. This was also the first time I had experienced any form of harassment at work, but that wasn't even the worst part. A week later, another regular, a woman a couple of years older than me, used to work at the lingerie shop and currently works at a diner. I don't know how we got into it, but she also had experience with Gregory. He apparently had walked into the store where they sell gay items too, and asked angrily why they carried this sodomy in their stores and proceeded to rub the lotions they had all over his face. I learned that he is constantly in and out of jail for trespassing into places that he's been banned from, including the coffee shop I worked at, which no one knew he was banned from. And he has some mental issues that he handles by doing drugs. I don't know what kind of drugs, but Arkansas is the meth state, and I can assume that's the kind of behaviour it is. The second, and possibly worst incident with him, is when the woman I was talking to had a co-worker of hers who met Gregory at the diner. She was opening at 4.30am with her boyfriend when Gregory, who was already banned, knocked on the locked door and asked for food. The boyfriend said he needed to leave and go away. Gregory got angry and replied to the girl, How dare you do this to me? Treat me in this way. Whatever happens to you next is your fault. He was later overheard saying that if he got a chance to be alone with her, he would assault her sexually. He's been known to threaten other women with that as well. I was already afraid that he would later come back while me and my small, sweet co-worker were working together to get some kind of revenge. But I wouldn't have expected that. I watched, and sometimes still watch, my back for a few months. I saw him once more before I stopped working at that job, and he sent chills down my spine. He glanced at me with zero expression, and I tried telling my male co-worker who he treated normally with a creepy smile, not to serve him. I hid in the back and waited until he left, and thankfully, haven't seen him since. Funny addition, but in the middle of him talking about how he can't find a woman, I was very close to saying 
that he's not even talking to a woman, but decided against it, thinking, well, he may very actually hurt me at this point. I now carry a knife on me, wherever I go. My dad's side of the family is based out of Southern Ohio. Once every year or so, my parents and I would make the six hour drive to visit my grandma and my dad's old friends. I dreaded these trips because of the excruciating boredom that was always involved. I was just a seven year old kid, an only child with strict Catholic parents who refused to buy her a Game Boy. So I would jump at every chance to entertain myself. This usually meant going to the store with my mum or tagging along with my dad when he went to see his friends. One of my dad's friends, Dave, had two boys, Henry and Sean, both a few years older than me. When my dad went to visit Dave, I would be expected to go join him on whatever the boys were doing which was mostly sitting in the basement playing some first person shooter on their big screen. On one of the occasions I was getting bored of watching Henry and Sean shoot NPCs, so I suggested we play hide and seek. Henry agreed, but Sean demanded that we play with all the lights off. I was still afraid of the dark, so I whined about it, but Sean pulled the it's my house card which is insurmountable as a kid. Henry and I found our hiding spots and then the lights went out and Sean began to count. One, two, Freddy's coming to get you. This was unsettling and after that there was silence and I waited. It wasn't long before the adrenaline started to build and I had felt the super disquiet that children feel in the dark many times before. But in that moment, I felt the full weight of terror. I knew in my whole heart that something was going to happen to me if I was found. I don't know how long I stayed in my hiding spot, but eventually I was seized by survival instincts and bolted to the top of the stairs where light shined through the crack at the bottom of the door. I just yelled, I don't wanna play anymore after being chided and called a baby. I was led upstairs to Sean's room with the promise that we were going to find something else to do. I didn't care what it was. I was just glad to be out of the basement. When we entered Sean's room and Henry closed the door, I stood there watching Sean dig through a drawer. In my head, he was looking for a game we could all play. I was wrong. He suddenly produced a large knife. He proceeded to open it, smile, and say, I would love scaring the crap out of civilians. He then started inching towards me with the knife in his fist. I backed against the wall and started to panic, my face contorting and tears welling up. I began hyperventilating for the first time in my life. Henry stood to my left blocking my only way out. Fortunately, he said, you're making her cry, let her go, and opened the door. I ran as fast as I could into the living room, and I sat down at my dad's feet, still shaking and tearful. I didn't tell on Sean, fearing he'd try and get back at me for it. My dad didn't notice the state I was in. He was absorbed in the episode of Cops that was on TV. I was thankful that we drove away from there. Years later, I was talking with my mum and the subject of Dave and his family came up. I recounted my story, apparently for the first time, and she told me she knew all along that Sean wasn't right. She said one night when our families were together having a bonfire, Sean caught a large frog. He began throwing it up in the air and letting it thud on the ground. Once he got bored with that, he started dangling it over the fire. My mum told him to stop, so he paused, looked her dead in the eye, and threw the frog in the fire. My mum said she'll never forget the sizzling noise the frog made 
as it was engulfed with flames. It's been years since our families had contacted each other, but I think about Sean and Henry often. Part of me wants to check the Ohio Criminal Database to see if Sean has a record. It wouldn't surprise me. My story goes like this. When I was 15 and a sophomore in high school, two of my friends came over to stay the night. We wanted to go visit another friend's house who lived across an arroyo. In New Mexico, that's what we call ditches and a few streets away. It wasn't that far to walk and it was around 11 p.m. We begged my mum to let us walk because we three girls together felt like we could take on the world. We dressed in hats and baggy sweatshirts because we felt like that would make us less noticeable. What can I say? We were just teenagers. We decided to start walking after wearing down my mum, who finally allowed us to go. She tried convincing us to let her drive multiple times. I wish she had. Walking under a very dark night sky in the cold seemed fun and adventurous. We laughed and talked a lot, crossed the arroyo, and turned along a street that was a little more lit than the main ones. We thought it would be safer. It was just a typical suburban neighborhood. We get three houses down, and in our rear we hear a car. A car coming along without its lights on. Uh, okay. A bit creepy. We decide to hustle along, and he speeds up. He was right next to us. We would speed up, and he would do the same. We slowed down. So would he. A man with glasses driving alone. I was starting to get really scared. My heart was pounding, and I was regretting being a 15-year-old who felt like it was a good idea to walk after dark. The man taps on his little horn. Not a loud honk, but a short one. He stares at us. Well, that's when we started freaking out. We decided right there and then, and they were going to knock on a neighbor's door to see if they would let us in to call my mum. All the houses along the row were dark, so we rushed back towards the corner house just before the dark arroyo, and we would inevitably have to cross it to get home. It was the last house that we could try. By the way, none of us had cell phones as this was 2001, and most high schoolers didn't have phones back then. Home phones and pay phones only. We knock on the door while the car followed again and stopped right at the house we were at. An older lady opens the door very hesitantly with her husband. We explained that we were sorry, but we were being followed by a single man in a car and he's really scaring us. She lets us in to use her phone and I remember her house being filled wall to wall with crucifixes. Nothing against crucifixes, but in that situation, that scared me even more. When we came back outside, the car was gone. We got picked up and home safe. We could hardly get to sleep after the adrenaline rush. It was one of the scarier moments of my life. What was even scarier still was I rode my bike in broad daylight back to that house the next day to leave a thank you note for letting us use the phone when most people wouldn't. As I pulled around the corner, I saw that the car that was following us was in the neighbor's driveway. That has forever spooked me. I now have two kids of my own, and I will never, ever want them walking around at night. This was 2015. I wasn't really actively looking, but would pop on OkCupid every few weeks to see if anything interesting was in my inbox. Being female, I had a very active inbox. Sorry guys. And I noticed an email from an interesting, fairly local guy. Email was alright, asking about polyamory. Which I don't mind talking about, 
if the person asking is sincerely interested and respectful. We got into chatting, and I had zero romantic interest, but thought this could be a friendship. After a few months of chatting, he found me on the Book of Faces, and asked if it was okay to send an ad request. I agreed. We'd been chatting, getting along well, and he seemed like a nice person. Little weird, but that's okay. I'm a little weird myself. No big deal. We continued to chat here, and for about two years. We'd send birthday greetings, just casual friendship, and he asked me several times to meet and hang out. I've considered it, but at the time I was running my own business and working an upwards of 70 hours a week, plus maintaining my own home, raising my younger child, as the older is an adult, and trying to balance two partners, an extremely needy demanding alcoholic client who has no boundaries, 11pm phone calls occurred without a note of hesitation or remorse on vacation, so meetups never occurred, but we kept in touch online. Late last year, a new story broke out about a man and his girlfriend, who sexually assaulted and then killed the woman's young teenage daughter. I never connected the name until a few friends contacted me and said, Oh, I see your friends with Thingy in the news. The news stories all use his full legal name, not his nickname. Think Richard versus Dick, which is why I never connected the two. It was him. My then online friend of two years had beaten, sexually assaulted, and killed, and then dismembered his girlfriend's teenage daughter, with his girlfriend's help. He made several statements since then, stating that he's always had this fantasy, and that the child was very seductive, and that it wasn't fun finishing her, as he apparently thought it would be. It still sends a chill down my spine. I dodged a bullet big time. Be safe out there. You never know who's on the other side of that keyboard or phone call. When I was 17, my mum and I argued quite a bit. I always found her to be irrational, and I had a hard time choosing to be the adult, as I often had to. One day, I was upstairs in my room playing a multiplayer FPS on my PC, when my mum hollered up the stairs to me that I needed to take out the trash, because it was going to get picked up the next morning. I had explained to her before all about how you can't pause online gaming. So all I did was holler back, okay, in a minute. There was no warning signs. I had no idea she was upset until she was already up the stairs and in my room, screaming about me not getting up and doing it right away. She thrashed my room in a matter of seconds, breaking everything, including my monitor and a glass star-shaped candle that my great-grandmother had left me when she passed. Usually, I tried to be the adult. Sometimes, I argued with her. This time, all I really did was say something along the lines of, I'd rather be dead than live with you. This was meant to imply that I was going to move out soon. Apparently, she took it as me threatening to take my own life. She called the police, and she talked to them alone, and I talked to them alone. I made them look at my room, and my mum didn't have anything crazier to tell them that I had done than the actual truth, which was not taking out the garbage quick enough. They confided in me that they believed me, and that they agreed that my mum sounded kind of crazy. But they pointed out to me that I was a minor, and my choices were to live there and follow all of her rules, or to be put in some sort of home. They said that due to the nature of the call, they needed to take me to mental health, regardless of whether or not I wanted to continue to live with her. On the way there, they assured me that they could tell I wasn't a threat to myself, and that I would just have to sit down with the therapist for a few minutes and could be on my way. 
In the waiting room, it was just me and one other person. A girl who was on meth, and had just been in some sort of domestic dispute. She kept talking to me, and she had the wildest look in her eyes. I've seen a lot, and I'm not easily scared. But she was somewhat intimidating without trying to be. The worst part was that she kept going into the bathroom and coming back out with blood all over her hands. She would walk away from me just seeing her normal crazy self, but would exit the bathroom with her bloody hands in the air, a hysterical mess. She would be crying and screaming and saying that things didn't make sense. The first couple of times, the nurses thought she had been cutting herself and kept demanding that they tell them where the source of the blood was. But the last couple of times, she did it, and they didn't ask her where the blood was from at all. I was still curious, but I still didn't want to ask. It made no sense to me that the staff could just get used to this. It wasn't a big deal when she would go back into the bathroom and come up with blood all over her hands, her whole body trembling and her eyes wide and her face covered in tears. They got me to see the therapist. She was really nice and very understanding. And after talking to me for a few minutes, she told me that she dealt with people like me all the time and that I wasn't one of the ones she needed to worry about. So I would be being released as soon as I left the room. She let me use her phone in her office to call a friend who would come and pick me up. I told him he needed to hurry up and get there as quick as possible to get me the hell out. Briefly mentioning the girl with the repetitively bloody hands. It was the disgusting yet sympathetic look that came over the therapist's face as I said this that finally clued me into what the blood must have been. All of a sudden, it clicked in my mind and I knew that there was only one way that female could have been having that blood all over herself, and yet had no wounds. The image of her bloody hands, only two feet away from my face, flashed in my mind. And I suddenly felt embarrassed, and didn't know what to say. All the relevant information had been relayed, so I hung up on my friend and left the therapist's office without saying anything. Luckily, the girl wasn't in the waiting room anymore as I passed through it, nodding at the receptionist at the front desk. I can honestly say that when I left that building that day, I was happy to be going home to my rational mother. She no longer seemed so bad now that I had something to compare her to. From time to time, I think of that girl, and imagine her out there somewhere in the world. I wonder what kind of crazy stuff she's been through and what kind of crazy stuff she's currently mixed up in. I hear someone call someone else crazy, and I quietly think to myself that they likely have never seen what I have seen. I seriously hope that I'm never on her level, and I hope to never meet her again. When I was 12, my parents left town for a second honeymoon at Niagara Falls. They left my brother, who was 17, in charge of 12-year-old me and my 10-year-old sister. A few days after my parents left, my brother told me that my sister was sleeping over at her friend's house, and that he was getting drunk and high at his buddy's place. He gave me very good instructions to not set the house on fire or to rip my balls off and that I would have the house to myself. A few hours after my brother left, my Saint Bernard started barking his head off at the woods near my house. I thought there was just a bear or a wild dog nearby, and my dog wanted to fight. It was really aggressive towards strangers in his territory. I ignored him for about half hour, and I got sick of the barking, and went downstairs to lock him in my parents' room. But as I went to go to the living room to grab him, I saw a man looking straight at my dog through the glass door. He was trying to pick the lock. I freaked out and told him to piss off and barely managed to wrangle my dog into my room. I called the police 
and then my parents. The police came by 25 minutes later and basically told me they picked up a guy trying to break into a parked car and they wanted to see if it was the guy who tried to break in as the idiot didn't wear a mask for either crimes. Sure enough it was, and he also confessed to being the culprit behind other burglaries around town. And he also ratted out his meth cooking slash selling partners. <laughs>